So what do we have here in terms of number of loci and the allelic diversity? Um, for trypneuses, uh, we developed a total of uh, 11 loci. We've got pretty high diversity, 8 to 33 alleles per, per locus, so lots of power. Even more loci in, um, in Scarus rubroviolacea, 17 loci, 3 to 20 alleles um, per locus in this case. So we've got a fair number of alleles, fair number of loci, um, good power to do these kinds of analyses. So I'll present then some data on both these spe species, and we're first focusing on the Hawaiian Islands. So these are the ends essentially for the two different organisms. Um, obviously for the urchin, we're doing much better here. We've got samples in the hundreds um, around the main Hawaiian Islands, all the main Hawaiian Islands. We've got um, several sites within islands, but as I'll show um, in the next few slides, it turned out that didn't really matter. So we kind of reduced our sampling effort a little bit um, with the uhu, with the parrotfish, um, to, to do our tests. Thanks to um, Rob Tone and Brian Bowen in their labs, we've got some sampling from the Northwest Hawaiian Islands for, for parrotfish as well as um, Johnson Atoll, so we can include those um, in this analysis. So I'll show you then some plots from structure, trying to fit a model to these data for both organisms, so we can get an idea for, well, how many populations are likely to be out there. And you may or may not have seen these kinds of plots for population genetic data. It's a, it's a result of a clustering analysis. And um, Q is on the y-axis, which is the probability that one individual, so each bar along this massive plot, this is like 750 individuals, represents one individual's genetic sample. And the color represents the probability that it fits within one cluster defined in the model, and the cluster is really the K, is the population. So in this case, though, I've just forced it to accept a clustering, accept a, a model of three populations and put every sample into, um, into three different clusters. And basically what you can see is it doesn't like that model essentially because each individual is divided up into those three populations almost equivalently, about a third of them is in each, each, um, each one of those clusters that I've hypothetically superimposed on the data. So what you can think of that as meaning is that the genome of each individual is essentially made up of a third of each one of these clusters, which just means that it's all freely interbreeding. If we look at the, um, the actual likelihood of a series of different models, you find out, sure, that the optimal K in the situation, the optimal number of populations, is actually one. So it's one population all the way from Johnston to Northwest Hawaiian Islands all the way down the main Hawaiian Islands. Absolutely no evidence for structure in this data set. <coughs> We look at the urchin data for the main Hawaiian Islands. <laughs> Again, this is John Fitzpatrick's work. Um, he gets essentially the exact same result. Again, I've forced a model of three clusters on the data. We get this parsing out of clusters between for each individual. Um, if we look at the optimal population, run a whole series of models, again, we find one population fits uh, the data the best. So um, the take home message then for the Hawaiian Islands and these two organisms is that essentially um, there's no structure. And if you want to just use pairwise FST, that data tells us exactly the same thing. No significant um, structure between any pairs of samples um, in this data set. <laughs> okay, so what's the take home me message? Well, basically the, the connectivity, and this is a very different story than the Opihi, is that um, among the Hawaiian Islands is clearly high enough to erase any differences caused by geographic isolation. So that these migration parameters within this matrix are one, very, very high, so high that we can't, we couldn't even, we can't really detect any subtlety between, between the M's in this matrix. So a lot of, a lot of migration happening between all, um, all islands. Okay, so what, what about if we step back a little bit and look beyond the Hawaiian Islands? And now I'm talking about <laughs> a collaboration between um, my lab as well as several other people to ask the question, well, what, what's the bigger picture in terms of regional variation in each one of these organisms. And we've got um, a great uh, team of people that are providing samples, also sequencing and genotyping. So we can take our data from Hawaii and then compare it to um, surrounding regions. And um, just as a side note that there is some morphological variation in trypneustes. Some people think that it's actually species level variation. So we do get something way on the edge called um, trypneustes elatensis in the Red Sea. Gratilla is supposed to be distributed throughout the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. And then uh, something called Trypneustes uh, depressus occurring um, in the eastern, uh, eastern Pacific. So we'll do the same thing. We'll use structure again, put all the data in there, and see, well, what are the patterns? And this is the kind of diagram you get. So now we're seeing <coughs> some more separation of different populations, but at a very large scale. So for example, these solid colors indicate essentially one population, wherever those samples are coming from. 
So yeah, well, there's, a, there's a very isolated population way out here in the Red Sea, a very isolated set of populations on the east coast of Panama, but the, the middle of it is really interesting. Um, the middle is very broadly distributed um, from basically from uh, the green and the red uh, um, clustering, clusters <coughs> occurring all the way from Eastern Island pretty much to Japan and also into the Indian Ocean. So beyond Hawaii, um, there's occasional dispersal at a very large scale in Tripmustes gratilla. We can look at pairwise FST between Hawaii and Japan. We do start to pick up a significant difference at that level. So there's some structure at that level. But you've got to go a long way with Tripmustes gratilla before you really see any population structure. We can do the same thing. And, um, if you're interested in phenotypic variation and problems like, like speciation, sure that these, these phenotypes actually map onto this diagram pretty well. I might be forcing speciation then in this group. What about uh, the broader picture for uh, rubroviolaceous? We can do the same kind of exercise, and um, we see some a similarity in terms of the total no number of populations. The model says there's four populations, um, but the biogeographic boundaries in those populations are quite different. Very distinct uh, Indian Ocean versus Central Pacific. Hawaii is coming out just about to be a unique population in this parrotfish. You can see a little mixture with this uh, Central Pacific uh, population by these bars here, but really solid purple color, kind of a unique uh, area. You might even think of it as an ecological or evolutionary significant unit here in Hawaii. In the Eastern Pacific, again, very strongly differentiated. So um, what can we conclude then from those kinds of analyses, both at the regional or the Hawaiian scale, as well as beyond the Pacific? Um, so these are some basic conclusions. I'll talk about those first, and then I'll talk about maybe some specific uh, management implications. One is that um, it's clear that these, these reef herbivores have very high dispersal among the main and northwest Hawaiian islands. Um, at regional scales, Hawaii's geography is more isolating clearly for parrotfish than for urchins. So we have some difference between these species that might indicate something either about um, larval biology between the two species or even adult ecology. Uh, there may be difference in the kinds of specialization, um, demographic parameters between these species that contribute to that overall um, structural pattern that we may need to think about. What are some management implications of our work? Well, it's clear in the main Hawaiian islands, that local management is going to have potentially a regional um, um, impact, regional effects because of the dispersal of, of these organisms. The converse of that is that in your MPA, you may not have an immediate or consistent effects on those local fisheries you're trying to manage. That's because the recruits are being subsidized um, from other places. So, you know, when people say, well, we made a, we designed an MPA, but there's no, you know, we don't see any effect, you might have to wait a while, or that effect might be very inconsistent depending on how, how subsidized that population is by external recruitment. And um, the other point I'd like to make is that these, these reef resources are broadly connected to our Pacific neighbors, um, um, at least uh, for some species, particularly in, in terms of Tripnustes gratilla. So we're going to clearly have to be start, start thinking about management at these regional scales and not just the state of Hawaii um, if we want to um, improve the overall um, quality of our reefs. Uh, okay, I'd just like to say <laughs> thanks, of course, to the Hawaiian Coral Reef Initiative for the funding. Um, we've had a bunch of people that have helped us with various aspects of this work, particularly the collecting. I'll just mention them there, and I hope I haven't um, forgotten um, any others. Um, it's possible. Uh, and uh, if there are any questions, I guess I'll, I'll take them now.